Hi, everyone. My name is Emmy Amaretti, and I am our Online Writing Center Assistant Director, and I'm here tonight with my wonderful colleague, our writing tutor and multilingual specialist, Sarah Taboada. Say hi, Sarah. Ahoy, everybody. <laughs> So during tonight's webinar, we'll be discussing how to move beyond summary to add analysis and synthesis in your writing. Keep in mind that tomorrow we'll send out links to the recording and the slide deck for the webinar and the links to the resources in the slide deck will be active. During the presentation, please feel free to type any questions into the chat and Sarah and I will pause as needed to do our best to answer them. So this webinar addresses the complementary concepts of analysis and synthesis. Our learning objectives for both concepts are to first gain an understanding of the terms and your professor's expectations of how you should be using these in your writing. And then we'll identify examples of both analysis and synthesis before we have some time to practice ourselves. So let's begin by focusing on learning objective one understand analysis, synthesis, and faculty expectations for integrating both into our writing. First, um, one of the reasons we developed this webinar is that faculty members have communicated with the Online Writing Center that they would like their students to be able to analyze and synthesize more successfully. In fact, um, missing ineffective, missing or ineffective analysis and synthesis are some of the most common reasons that points are deducted for writing. This might be suggested with comments like these in your papers. First, CAPA. They're not usually referring to APA format here, but APA style. Writing an APA style means writing scientifically and explicitly with evidence-based argumentation. We'll go over this tonight. Another comment you might see is work on your connections. Connect to this. What is the significance of this or SIG? Meal, which is a reference to a particular paragraph development mnemonic device. We'll go over that too. Or you might see needs synthesis. So the meal plan stands for a helpful starting point, or it is a helpful starting point for short papers, and it stands for main idea, evidence, analysis, and lead out. Um, by short papers, we mean a length of about three to five pages. However, the meal plan is missing one element, synthesis, which involves building more meaning, new ideas, and new connections. Uh, the um, meal plan is good for reporting what others have said, but when we want to build new ideas, we need a little bit more. Um, in fact, the word synthesis means combining parts to make a new whole. Beyond the meal plan, we have the no tears plan, which was developed by our colleague, Dr. Basil Considine, who is here with us tonight. Um, and it's useful for writing evidence-based arguments and writing at the graduate level. Um, on this slide, we have a link to a blog post that you can read to learn more about this plan. And the No Tears plan stands for topics, uh, not, nothing omitted, that's the NO, then tears, topic sentence, where you state the paragraph, topic, or claim, evidence slash argumentation, where you support the claim, analysis, where you discuss the evidence and how it connects to the topic, repeat, where you repeat the evidence and analysis as necessary, and synthesis, where you discuss what all these things mean when you put it together. That's that new hole that we talked about a little while ago. Then at the end, you'll have a concluding or transitioning sentence to finish discussing what these things mean or connect them to the next paragraph's main idea. Um, a good rule of thumb for paragraphs written in this no tears style is a length of about five to seven sentences. Now that we've looked at the basics of the meal plan and the no tears plan, let's go back to our central question. What are analysis and synthesis? So they are key parts of critical writing. In the Online Writing Center, we recognize that you come to ACU with really good ideas, and we believe that good writing is good thinking. So as you continue to hone and demonstrate your critical thinking skills in your courses, you'll naturally get better at writing critically with your own analysis and synthesis of ideas. We get better at things that we practice often. One way to practice is by reading others' critical writing and looking for examples of analysis and synthesis. 
Once you recognize it in others' writing, you can begin, you can begin to model your own writing after theirs. Not to take their ideas, but just to have a framework or a foundation on which your own writing can grow. Tonight, we'll look at authentic examples of others writing together, just for that reason. Um, analyzing and synthesizing are also key parts of an effective argument. Each paper you write involves making arguments or claims that are convincing and clear. So what's one way to do this? Well, we do it by laying out connections. And one thing we will keep coming back to in this presentation is the idea of connecting the dots for your reader. Transition. transition. Yeah, transitions are a great way to do this. And um, I like to think of them as built-in GPSs for your paper that kind of direct the reader where you're heading or where the paper is heading. But Emmy also has a great analogy for how to make those connections. As you can see, Sarah and I uh, have choral enthusiasm for transitions. So <laughs> we can think of it also as how is your argument bolstered by others' research? And how does your claim fit within the literature and larger conversation on your topic? When you're looking at these points, transitions are going to help you make those connections. Um, next, when you bring in a piece of evidence, like a quotation from a course reading, and you plop it into a paragraph and move on to discussing more of your ideas, sometimes analysis and synthesis are missing. So this webinar is intended to give you the tools for how to interpret and show the meaning of evidence in your paragraphs. Lastly, as previously mentioned, um, without effective analysis and synthesis, your papers will be less successful, and you might lose some points. So we want to talk about by the end of this webinar we hope you will more confidently recognize how you can walk your readers through your understanding of how different pieces of our evidence and argument relate in other words how to connect the dots for your reader some styles leave analysis and synthesis up to the reader like they draw their own conclusions they draw inferences but in apa style we don't want them to have to infer anything we want you to write all your connections out. This strengthens your writing and it follows APA style, which most of our ACU online programs use. Let's dive into analysis first and define exactly what that means. In its basic form, analysis is the discussion and explanation of evidence or argumentation. It's more than simply presenting evidence. It answers the question, so what? Why does this matter? Analysis often involves comparing different evidence and adding your own comments to why this evidence matter, matters or furthers your argument. So let's look at some examples together. Here are a couple of sentences that I might see in the Writing Center and I think, okay, this is really good evidence, but something's missing here. Spencer et al. found that families can sometimes experience strengthened bonds as a direct result of a traumatic event. Many mindful practices like yoga, meditation, or time outdoors can facilitate relational resilience and growth during the COVID-19 pandemic. So you may have felt as I was reading that there was no connection between these ideas or back to this writer's main argument. What, what's the point they're trying to make by listing these different details? Especially because the sentences place very opposite language about traumatic events and mindfulness next to each other, the reader may have trouble figuring out the relationship. Now, here's an example of what adding analysis to those sentences looks like. Um, so we've added, in line with this research and Prime et al's concept of post-traumatic growth, the findings of a 2022 study suggest that many mindful practices like yoga, meditation, or time outdoors can facilitate relational resilience and growth during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this phrasing here, the student has used to add analysis in the form of connecting the two pieces together. By saying in line with this research, it signals that the studies are connected and the conceptual framework of post-traumatic growth tells us how they're connected. You'll also note that the details with evidence have citations attributing them to other writers, but the bolded idea as a whole 
in line with this research and Prime et al's concept of post-traumatic growth does not. Even though the linking idea mentions Prime et al, the idea that all these sources are related is clearly this author's own idea. Because analysis involves your own reflections and explanations of the evidence, it doesn't require citations. Only the sentences that are paraphrased or quoted from other sources need citation. There are more ways to think about analysis, though, so let's read a couple more examples. First, consistent with Achike, Emmanuel discovered that COPD patients responded positively to the treatment over one year. As you can see in this example, the analysis, which is in bold, consistent with Achike, can be in the same sentence as the evidence. Emmanuel discovered that COPD patients responded positively to the treatment. The sentence shows how the evidence from Emmanuel relates to another piece of evidence. It connects the dots and it shows in this case why the information is meaningful to the discussion. If we had left the evidence from Emmanuel on its own, we wouldn't know that this information is actually further evidence that builds on a previous study, which gives credibility to the argument. The more proof you have, the better. So this is an example of how evidence can strengthen your argument. Here's another example. First, we have a sentence of evidence. Smith found that birth order and personality traits were connected. Then we have a sentence of analysis. However, Smith's results are less likely to be generalizable due to the use of a small homogenous population of 11 siblings. Here, rather than connecting this evidence to other studies, the analysis comments on a limitation of Smith's study. Smith may have found something interesting, but it isn't generalizable due to the small population sample. Thus, it's important to acknowledge that this information is not the only evidence we can use if we want to connect birth order to personality traits. We would need to find more research to back up that claim. Many programs at ACU have an annotated bibliography assignment, and in that paper, there's often a section in which you are explicitly asked to analyze the articles you're reading. Part of that is assessing the reliability or usefulness of a study to what you're interested in researching. So you can think about analysis in this way too. It's like your judgment or your commentary on a piece of evidence. Note that you're commenting on one piece of evidence as opposed to synthesis where you're commenting on multiple pieces of evidence. And we're gonna, Emmy's gonna go over that a little more later. But I like how she mentions the annotated bibliography. That's a great example of analysis because you're discussing each article individually and building on that, the lit review takes the sources you've analyzed individually in your annotated bibliography and merges them together through synthesis by presenting them not as individual pieces, but uniting them by themes. That's a great point, Sarah. So to sum up, analysis is when you connect the dots between evidence, connect evidence to your argument and or context, and comment on why a piece of evidence matters. In other words, the so what. So before we dive into more practice with analysis, let's go over the definition and examples of synthesis. The reason we talk about these two ideas together is that they are, in fact, pretty similar. So you might see some crossover in the definitions. If you recall from earlier, we talked about the meal plan. The meal plan stops at analyzing evidence. But as you work toward graduate level writing, synthesis becomes more and more necessary. One distinction that we'll make is that synthesis goes beyond analysis. Analysis often focuses in on just one piece of evidence to explain it, as Sarah just said. But synthesis, on the other hand, involves discussing multiple pieces of evidence or arguments together. It also goes further than connecting the evidence to your topic, as you do in analysis, because synthesizing requires you to really step in as the author and provide new conclusions based on all the information that you've presented. Um, it's often a requirement in a graduate level writing project, because instead of just reporting on what others have found, you as a scholar should enter into the discussion and bring new ideas and conclusions to it. Synthesis allows you to take a lot of information and basically you're going to provide your take on it. So you're going to connect the dots and then at the end, pow, there's this big star where you put it all together. 
um, <laughs> synthesis. Um, in addition, some good questions to come back to when you're writing in pursuit of synthesis are, what do these things mean when we put them together? And how do you as the author interpret what you have presented? Next, we're going to look at some examples of synthesis. Um, first, these consistent results across multiple studies and diverse populations validate the applicability of the cog cognitive behavioral model to this problem. Um, if you see patterns in multiple resources, pointing those out is an important way to synthesize. Here we're talking about consistent results across multiple studies. It's a pattern. In some papers, you're often specifically instructed to synthesize the course readings from the week. And this involves finding and pointing out those connections and overall themes from lots of sources. Um, here's another example in the next sentence. The recent research on the positive impact of mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, training in various contexts means that it could also be an effective tool for higher education administration. So this is the kind of sentence that draws together multiple sources and it makes a new claim about how the information could be applied in your research context. In this case, the author is writing about the context of higher ed administration. Often you'll need to use sentences of synthesis to justify your research plans. If you think something is relevant, you should demonstrate that by including the evidence, but don't stop there. If you've listed a few sources that discuss MBSR's impact in various contexts, but you never include a sentence like this one, your claim is buried in the evidence. And the reader needs to know how specifically do you discuss, does your discussion in these other contexts relate to your research context of higher ed administration? Sometimes it takes stepping back to see the big picture, but it's necessary to do your synthesis well. Um, literature reviews uh, require a great deal of synthesis. So if you're diving into literature on a topic, you will need to take a step back and consider what are the key themes you're going to focus on and how will you organize all the information in a purposeful way. Let's read this last example of synthesis. A growing body of research indicates that involvement with spiritual belief, practice, and community can encourage resilience and post-traumatic growth. This example demonstrates a synthesis of points that becomes a roadmap for the lit review to follow. The lit review will focus on common themes that the writer has discerned regarding spiritual belief, spiritual practice, and community in that order. So I like to use pointillism to explain synthesis. Um, this is for you visual learners like me. Pointillism is a style of painting that uses tiny dots close together to make a painting. So I have an example here, although I've covered most of the painting up. When you're researching, you have to imagine that each dot is a piece of evidence or idea from the literature. It can be really easy to zoom in and get lost in all those individual dots, especially if the research is of great interest to you and you enjoy the reading. But even if you don't enjoy researching, there can simply be an overwhelming amount of information to dig through on any given topic. All these dots just don't look like much when you have your nose buried in the middle of it um, or in the middle of a book, like the painting in this example. So what does synthesis do? It allows you to take a few steps back so you could see how each of those dots you had your nose stuck in fit into a larger picture. So that line we saw was actually part of a sailboat. The blue dots are part of the body of water. Um, writing down the ways that all your evidence fits together is the overarching goal of synthesis. As you find resources and ideas that are relevant to your papers, be sure to make a note of how they connect to your big picture. As a visual learner myself, I love Emmy's big picture visual example. I also like to think of writing in terms of a picture, but I think of it as a puzzle. So all the board pieces are your outline or topic, and all the other pieces usually get placed into stacks based on similarities. So all the sky pieces go together, the boat pieces go together, the clouds, and so on. And once you have your stacks, it's much easier to fit your pieces together because you already know that they go to that they go together, so. I love that analogy too, Sarah. Um, if we have questions, 
Now is a great time to ask them because Sarah and I have covered a lot of examples and information so far. Uh, you can send a private chat or enter your question into the chat room and we will be glad to go into anything in more detail. Basil says, are there any recommendations for how to check your work to see whether or not it includes clear synthesis? Uh, yes, you can make an appointment with the writing center. We're really good at that. <laughs> that is what I was going to say, Sarah. <laughs> I can see why we have, they have the two of us presenting this webinar together. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Let's, no, but it's true because the Writing Center, you can either email it to us by uploading it to your appointment, or you can make a Zoom appointment if you want to talk it out with someone. That's true. So we have, we have a lot of options for helping you out. Basil says, how much will it cost me to get an appointment at the Online Writing Center? Is it less than $150 an hour? Oh, yes, Basil. It's a, it's a bag of oatmeal cookies. That's what it'll cost you. <laughs> Just kidding. Half, a, Half bag. a bag. We can barter, I guess. <laughs> we can maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe if it, maybe if it's one giant oatmeal cookie. But I'm not sharing it. But I'm, yeah, no, no sharing. <laughs> Sarah and I each need our own. Yes. <laughs> now, is yours an oatmeal cookie, or do you have a specific type of cookie you want it to be? I like oatmeal. Uh, I'm good with that. Okay. So okay. they'd only have to bake, like, one one type of cookie. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, seriously, our online writing center services are free. You can talk with um, Sarah or me or Dr. Considine when he has appointments available. We're, and all of our other tutors, we're happy to help. Yes. And also, honestly, just having somebody else look at your work, whether you're seeking help with synthesis or other things, is a great idea. Your peers can help, but we're so used to looking at papers that we have a special knack for these sorts of things. <laughs> okay, I don't see any other questions, so we mm -hmm. will move on to learning objective two. We are actually going to take some time to practice applying all this information that we've gone over so far. You are welcome to engage actively in the chat room, or you can simply watch and take it all in, just depending on how you learn best. We talked about learning styles a bit earlier. So I'll go over an example of how we will practice identifying analysis and synthesis, and then it'll be your turn. One thing to keep in mind is that analysis and synthesis look different for everyone, depending on the purpose of the paper. So your analysis and synthesis might look similar or different from the examples we're going to go over, but as you point out examples in the readings you encounter, your own writing practices will grow. So for practice number one, we're going to look at how analysis and synthesis look from the perspective of Kelly et al. Um, we're going to look at a paragraph from a journal article that they have published, changes in spiritual practices and relational well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to read through the paragraph sentence by sentence, categorizing the function of each sentence using Dr. Considine's No Tears mnemonic device. So as we're reading, be thinking about what you think are the sentences of evidence analysis and synthesis in the paragraph. First, Previous research indicates that spiritual beliefs and practices may influence family resilience in times of crisis in ways that can make a difference during the coronavirus crisis. So this sentence is a topic sentence. It tells the reader what this paragraph is about. There's a focus here on what previous research indicates about the influence of spiritual practice on family resilience in times of crisis. Next. For example, in recent perspective pieces in various scientific journals, scholars have argued for the potential benefits of spiritual practices, such as mindfulness, meditation, and yoga during the COVID-19 crisis. Here we have evidence and analysis. 
As the sentence shows, sometimes you can do more than one thing in one sentence. This writer has provided evidence um, about what Bihan and Bushel et al. have determined, and then they've added analysis by connecting the two works together. Some students think that pulling together multiple citations in one sentence is all you need to synthesize, but this is the beginning of synthesis. You're not really accomplishing it full on. When you make connections between multiple resources, you're still just reporting what others have found, so you're not really commenting on what it means. Um, the next sentence also mixes things up with more evidence and analysis. Let's read that one. Bushell et al. 2020 suggested that because of the likely ongoing nature of the pandemic, it would perhaps make sense in this context to speak of ongoing traumatic stress disorder, OTSD, rather than post-traumatic stress disorder, and connected the chronic stress associated with OTSD to previous research. Here we have transition, like for example, and um, the introductory phrase or narrative citation, Bushel et al. suggested, both these things are used to connect the sentences and create cohesion within the paragraph. And the last part of the final sentence, which suggests that meditation may be a useful treatment against the effects of chronic stress this is the author kind of tying everything together, which suggests is language that signals to the reader, hey, listen up, I'm connecting the dots here. It's taking everything that was said before and putting it all together into this new idea that meditation can be used to treat chronic stress, which is obviously the researcher's research interest. The next sentence on the new slide could also be categorized as a conclusion or a transition sentence, but it also serves as synthesis. So let's read this one. Consistent with Prime et al.'s conceptual framework of family well being during COVID 19, our study explores changes in spiritual practices in families. This is synthesis because it's connecting all the information from the paragraph back to the specific context or purpose of the essay which is family well-being in the COVID-19 pandemic. So in sum, if you take a theory or concept and apply it to your concept context, you are accomplishing synthesis. So for this next one, you guys can play along at home or wherever you are to categorize the sentences. Remember, here are several different types of sentences that you can look for. The topic sentence, the evidence or argumentation, the analysis, and the synthesis or a conclusion or transition sentence. Um, you are welcome to type the sentence number and your answer in the chat box, or you are welcome to sit back and just watch what we're doing. This is coming from a sample paper from our EDD program here at ACU. So I'm going to read each sentence and see if we have any people who want to guess at their answers or use their strong uh, critical thinking skills to share their thoughts on what the answer should be. Um, number one, leaders must understand how their strengths benefit the teams they lead. Number two, Neck et al. stated that great teams usually have leaders who successfully combine their skills and knowledge for the good of the team. Number three, however, before a leader can contribute to the theme, they must develop a foundation in self-leadership. Number four, leaders can develop self-leadership by having strengths-based coaches or mentors and wise counsel, to use Thompson and Miller Perrine's terms, to help in developing their own strengths. Number five, similarly to Thompson and Miller Perrine, Welch et al. described how these coaches work with leaders to develop strengths through internal motivation, strong relationships, guided growth, and reflection. And last, we have number six, overall leaders cannot lead alone. Being mentored and mentoring are both effective ways to develop one's strengths and leadership skills. 
So super, now we have read the whole thing. We're gonna go through and check your answers. So first, this is a topic sentence. It's the first sentence. It tells us that the paragraph is about strengths-based leadership. And you can see it's written in the author's own words. There are no citations here. This next one, number two, is evidence from Neck et al. The student has provided a piece of information from a resource and they have a good citation. This is a great example of incorporating just a short amount of quoted material in a sentence and avoiding what we call a dropped quote. The quote is well introduced with the author's information. There's a brief paraphrased intro to what they wrote and only the most important words from the original text are quoted. Number three, we can classify as both analysis and evidence. Um, using the transitional word, however, shows a connection between ideas. So this is analysis. The student is saying that there's more to say about the idea in the previous sentence. They're connecting neck et al. to the idea from Hanky and Holm. Then there's more evidence from that new source, Hanky and Holm. Number four is also evidence. It's a new piece of information from Thompson and Miller Perrine. It's evidence. Number five, once again, we have combined analysis and evidence in a sentence. Similarly to the transition shows how these pieces of evidence relate to one another, which is analysis. And then the student connects the dots between all the ideas by adding more information as evidence. Number six is our synthesis sentence. It starts with the word overall, it tells how we're going to tie everything together, and the sentence could also be labeled a conclusion. Um, synthesis is sentences, that's hard to say, synthesis sentences and conclusion sentences are um, really closely connected in that often synthesis requires you as the writer to draw new conclusions about a topic. So this paragraph ends with a new idea that wraps up all the evidence that was summarized before it. We have previously pointed out the use of some transitional words in this paragraph. So here we've got, however, similarly, overall, bolded. And these are signal words that help move the reader along and build the connections throughout the different sentences in the paragraph. When it comes to our transitions, which are another means of connecting those dots or our built-in GPS, as I like to think about it, it's important to ask yourself, how is this content related? Are the details similar? Are they different? And that helps you identify what kind of transition word to use to indicate to the reader how your content is connected. They might be similar in some ways, but have key distinctions that set them apart from each other in which case, although is a great transition word to use. For example, although author or articles X and Z have insert the thing that they have in common, they disagree on Y. Or X focuses more on this, whereas Z prioritizes blah, blah, blah. The great thing about transitions is that if you can answer the question, how are these concepts related? Like I said before, you'll know what category transition to look under. And having word options like these goes a long way in destroying writer's block because you're not stuck trying to figure out what the best word to use is. You can, you have word options already available that you can choose from. Instead of trying to create the right transition out of thin air, you can cherry pick the words or phrase you think might work best or try a few different ones to find out which one works best or gets you back on track and flowing. And we have a great list from a handout from the APA website, which will be linked in the PDF for this slide deck when we share it with everyone. In 
addition to checking out this list of transitions from APA.org, you can also look through the Academic Phrase Bank from the University of Manchester, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, we have a slide that shows some examples from the Phrase Bank, which you can access via the link, or you can simply Google phrase, um, Academic Phrase Bank, and that website will pop up. I love this resource because the phrase bank provides sentence stems. So it kind of really helps you get started and helps you not get stuck or unstuck if you are stuck. Another great favorite of mine is smartwords.org because it also provides a list similar to the APA handout. And I like them because all you have, like we all have go-to transition words and these links help us sprinkle in variety and avoid overusing the same transitions. And um, while these links are great at combating writer's blocks, as we previously mentioned, another resource is scheduling a Zoom appointment to brainstorm with a tutor Sometimes just talking it out with someone is all we need to get over our mental road bump. So that is my wonderful spiel on how awesome transitions are. <laughs> For this next ex exercise, we want to give you a chance to try your hand at analyzing and synthesizing, which is what we've been talking about this whole time. Thanks so much, Sarah. So I'm going to read this paragraph and then I'll give you a chance to write down or take mental notes of some revisions that would incorporate analysis and synthesis to connect the dots in this paragraph. The last three sentences of the paragraph are all evidence without analysis or synthesis. So let's read. There have been studies on the value of therapy animals. Wesley et al. found that using therapy dogs improved drug treatment results. Chandler concluded that animal-assisted therapy in school settings significantly improved counseling options. Miller and Ingram conducted a study of animal-assisted therapy in nursing environments, finding statistically significant positive results for their use. So the question posed to you is, how would you change the paragraph to include analysis and synthesis? Basically, we have a bunch of details here, and um, the reader can't tell how to put it all together. So what's one way? <laughs> yes, Google Maps would be a great way. <laughs> This Google Map It problem solved. Google Map It. It will connect all your dots for you. Yes. <laughs> so we have time we're going to go over one example of how you could revise um, obviously the way you would do it is going to be personal to you because you're your writer and um, our writers in the writing center have put all this together so I'm going to read through the paragraph again and discuss the changes sentence by sentence first off the new topic sentence is much more specific. Um, the original was, there have been studies on the value of therapy animals, um, which doesn't tell the reader what you actually mean by value. The paragraph isn't about the value of therapy animals in general or their monetary value, as the previous sentence may have led the reader to believe. Um, so we've got multiple studies have supported the value of using therapy animals for a variety of conditions. While the first sentence was vague, this new sentence specifies the context, how they can be used to treat conditions. Um, in the next sentence, the evidence from Chandler about animal-assisted therapy is the same, but we've added a new idea. I'm sorry, the information. Yes, original was Chandler 2001 concluded that 
animal assisted therapy in school settings significantly improved counseling outcomes. But we've added this idea about Wesley's being consistent with Chandler. So this is consistent, builds that connection between the two sources, connecting the dots. Um, here's the next sentence. Using animal assisted therapy has also been validated in nursing environments. Miller and Ingram 2000. Originally, we had Miller and Ingram named in the sentence, and we said that they conducted a study of animal assisted therapy in nursing environments. Uh, so we've kept the evidence, but we've changed it by taking the evidence off the authors. Uh, we did this by putting their names in a parenthetical citation at the end of the sentence instead of highlighting them in the text of the sentence. In the first draft, um, the two sentences that we're talking about before and this one felt very disconnected. It was just two facts put in line together with no connection. But the revision shows how there are results not only in schools, but also in nursing environments. And while the first draft of the sentence may have been a closer paraphrase to the original text of Miller and Ingram, because it was more detailed, this revision shows that when you summarize sources as needed, you can highlight the information that you want to emphasize and control the flow of ideas. Getting rid of the extra details in this case helps the paragraph be more focused on the main idea about using therapy animals to treat a variety of conditions, and we're less focused on the intricacies of the particular source text. So then at the end, we just had finding statistically significant positive results for their use we have added synthesis by putting this full sentence. These studies and their findings suggest that therapy animal use enhances many treatments and might be might significantly improve PTSD treatment at the Gerber Clinic. The sentence answers the questions of what do all these um, details mean when we put them together? And it connects to the writer's specific context of a particular research site, the Gerber Clinic. Um, this brings us to the end of our webinar. Tonight, we use several illustrations and exercises to understand analysis, synthesis, and faculty expectations for integrating both into writing, identify examples of analysis and synthesis, and practice writing with analysis and synthesis. And thanks to Sarah, we did some bonus work with transitions to really help tie all your ideas together in these sorts of writing pieces. Um, Yes, we will um, have time for questions in a few minutes, but first let's go through the Online Writing Center information. We um, invite you to check out the Online Writing Center homepage in my ACU. You can watch the video linked here for the steps to make an appointment and submit a paper. We work with you at any stage of your writing. We do offer, as Sarah mentioned earlier, two types of appointments listed on the schedule. You can make an email slash asynchronous appointment where you upload your paper and we send you the feedback back by email in about 24 hours. Um, that email is usually called a writing center report. You can also make a Zoom appointment if you want to talk to us one on one. And at the time of the appointment, you would just go to the schedule and click on the Zoom link to connect to your tutor. Keep in mind that all of our appointments are in central time because everybody lives spread out all over the country. We still go by central time. You can also access many writing related resources on our online writing center website. Our online writing center submission process is pretty easy. You go to WC online and schedule an appointment and then you upload your paper to the appointment form. You do that regardless of whether you are um, having an email slash asynchronous appointment or a Zoom appointment. If you're going to bring a draft to your Zoom appointment, you can go ahead and upload it. And if you do it a little bit before the appointment, then the tutor may have time to look at it beforehand. So you can make um, really good use of your time together. Mm -hmm. You don't need to upload a paper necessarily if you're going to a Zoom appointment because you may just have brainstorming questions. So that's optional for Zoom. Yeah. And you don't have to upload your paper right when you make the appointment. You can make the appointment ahead of time. So if you know that you're going to have an assignment due and you want to make sure that you have it reviewed, you can schedule before you've even started writing. And as long as you upload 
a document before the time of your appointment, you're good to go. Absolutely, Sarah. That's a great point. You guys can actually make your appointments up to two weeks in advance if you know that you're going to want to talk to someone about a particular assignment or have someone review your assignment. Or if you just want to make sure you get your appointment in there every week before anyone else does, go ahead and do use your two-week window to um, make an appointment with a tutor. Yeah. Um, you can contact us through our central email address, onlinewritingcenter at acu.edu. You can schedule an appointment at the second link, or you can visit our Online Writing Center website at the third link at the bottom. We offer so many resources um, that are so helpful. We have our ACU APA course paper template, which has all of the uh, settings for APA built in. So that is um, kind of a relief and helps take a load off when you're trying to figure out at least that aspect of putting your papers together. We have a YouTube channel where we have some of our webinars posted and we have our online writing center blog where we talk about everything from uh, editing strategies to how tutors view your work to using AI in your work. So the range of ideas that you can check out there. We do have other webinars that you may want to uh, check out. Um, this one is linked to the sl slides in the video for From Summary to Evaluation, Adding Critical Thought. And we have another one on analysis and synthesis, especially as related to personal reflections. Um, so the slides in the video for that are linked here as well. And we come now to the end of our webinar. Sarah and I are so happy that you came and we got to learn together with one another tonight. Um, and after Sarah says bye, I will cut the recording and we will have some question time. Have a fantastic evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone.